Hello, um, I'm Carly and I will be hosting this event today, um, The Learnings of Embedding Access in Creativity. Um, have a seat, come on, don't be afraid, you can sit in the front row, we will not pick on you except for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Firstly, I'd love, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people, uh, the Wurundjeri and the Blorung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, we repay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and um, I really thank them for making up and telling stories on this land for 80,000 years. Um, sovereignty was never ceded. This is stolen land. Uh, if there are any Aboriginal people in the room today, I extend my friendship to you as well. I'd also like to acknowledge disability elders, um, past, present and emerging. Um, they have paved way for equity for us today. So, and uh, other, and also thank you to the Art Centre for hosting us. It's nice to be here. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that uh, my panellists do too. Um, I will introduce our wonderful panel. To my right, immediate right, is Sarah Ward. Sarah uh, is a cabaret artist. Uh, I'm going to put on my glasses. I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget that I need glasses. Talk amongst yourselves. Excellent. Sarah is a cabaret artist. She's an actor and writer, creator of cabaret character Yana Alana and Queen Kong. Sarah was awarded a Helpman and along with her creative team have 11 Green Room Awards, the Adelaide Fringe Award and the Melbourne Fringe Award for cabaret. Sarah's passion is the creation of subversive political work that challenges gender stereotypes and the status quo through her larger than life stage creations. Outside of her own work, Sarah was the MC for Circus Oz and has worked with La Soiree, Fina Kane and Smith, Retro Futurismus, Yummy Arena Theatre Company, Melbourne Works Theatre, and the Women's Circus. Sarah was co-creator of cult hip-hop cabaret act Sister She, which was popular in the early 2000s for creating feminist queer hip-hop shows. Sarah is a columnist for the Australian Education Union magazine. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Everyone clap. how long that was for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yawn. Yawn. I think Bex might be a bit longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Beck Matthews to my far right. Beck is a percussionist, drummer, performer, teacher, musical director, composer, sound designer, and noise maker. She's a graduate Victoria, of Victorian College of the Arts where she studied orchestral percussion. She toured as a permanent member of Circus Oz Ensemble, um, Swinging in the Air from Anthem Land to New York. Beck co creates the multi award winning act Diana Rolana and the Piranhas and has worked with the Melbourne Theatre Company's Paddling Women's Circus, Melbourne Workers Theatre, Music Viva VCA, George Dreyfus, Anya Anastasia and Reuben, Reuben K. Beck was the sound designer for Funatoriums. Um, these are very made up words here. Mm -hmm. Fun yeah. Funatoriums, <laughs> Circus Cabaret, Capitan Hop, Capitan? Is it Capitan? Yeah, Cap Captain Hook's uh, Pirate Party at the Sydney Opera House and was sound designer for the Flying Fruit Fly Circus award-winning production, Junk. Beck is currently a music director, sound designer and access coordinator for Queen Kong and the Homo Sapiens. Welcome, Beck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. Emma, Emma's is half a page. <laughs> To my left is Emma J Hawkins. <laughs> Emma is more than a triple threat performer, a little outside of the box with a bag of tricks bigger than herself. Performing since the tender age of 10, her first memory of being on stage was chasing a boy with a frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> since she's performed across Australia in many events, festivals and productions from Shakespeare to burlesque and all things in between. She has won over the hearts of children in The Big Bad Wolf as Heidi Hood, which toured internationally. She featured in the Malthouse play The Real and Imagined History of the Elephant Man and she's been nominated for a Green Room Award. Um, I'm paraphrasing now. Um, <laughs> she's even run away with the circus as a tap dancing, stilt walking acrobat. Emma has produced her own, her own award winning productions including her one woman show I Am Not a Unicorn. Uh, she's been a keen advocate for fair representation for artists with a disability in Australia theatre, film and TV. A member of the newly formed Performers with Disability Committee through Equity and she's a proud member of the Equity Diversity Committee. Uh, 
she's also the ongoing bookkeeper for the Women's Circus. She's currently the treasurer of Victorian Actors Benevolent Trust as well. So she's very good with money. Mm. If you need your finance system. <laughs> see, you see Emma. <laughs> um, and, and me, I have got two, one and a half lines for my bio. Um, <laughs> Because I should be able to talk talk to it. Um, I am Access and Inclusion Coordinator at Melbourne Fringe. I'm here today in my role at Melbourne Fringe. Um, I have started in this. I started in this role last year uh, in January or February rather, and um, I help artists make their shows accessible and also venues um, talk about uh, make their, their venues more accessible and communicate that they are. And I also help artists that identify as deaf and disabled um, to make art. Um, I have produced this pretty amazing, if I say so myself, producer's guide to access, which um, there are some copies at the back of the room if you want to take some or download it online. If you search Melbourne Fringe producer's guide to access, you'll find them. Um, I also write outside of Fringe and I speak and I organise events myself. So I'm passionate about making things accessible. Um, we also have two Auslan interpreters here today. We have Linda and Dave who will be interpreting. Um, if there is a need for Auslan interpreters, they will continue to interpret and I'll um, come back uh, in about 20 minutes to see and then they can sit down and clock off if there's no need. Okay. Oh, actually, the event is being filmed, so perhaps they will stay on for the whole time. Yes? Dave, Linda, thumbs up. Yep. <laughs> it's up to you. Thank you. Well, I think because of... Uh, and that was my next point, that the event is being filmed. So I think because of the event is being filmed, we want to make it as accessible for everybody. So Linda and Dave will stay on. Last week in the session I was in, um, our interpreters, who included Dave, didn't um, stay on for the whole session. But thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to get into it now. Um, I want to talk about why we make art accessible. I want to state that it shows everyone is welcome. It makes really good business sense to make your art accessible. It opens up to new audiences. It provides new ways to see art and it allows people with disability or disabled people, as I often say, to participate as an audience members as well as being performers and art makers. And there's lots of ways to make your art accessible, including but not limited to Auslan, audio description, wheelchair access, hearing loops, as well as participation and collaboration. Um, there was this great um, survey that was done last year, the National Arts and Disability Strategy, and it was run by the Department of Communication and the Arts. And the research came out earlier this year and it showed that 88% of people with disability agreed that going to arts events increases their sense of well-being and happiness and 86% of people with disability agreed that going to art events made for a richer and more meaningful life. The report also showed some really great findings around the way um, artists with disability and who are deaf um, increase our economy. That, that was really great. Um, it also had anecdotes from artists with disability and organisations that commented on the access, inaccessibility of venues. I'm going to quote a couple now. While good arts progress, uh, sorry, while good art progress has been made in the upgrading of venues to ensure our audience access, there remain significant problems with access to workshop and rehearsal and performance spaces for artists. And um, there was also some comment on the need for leadership opportunities in the arts because there are very few. Artists and arts workers with disability have leadership experience and aspirations but don't always have the opportunity to lead. That was one person who submitted to the uh, research. And the findings also stated that what makes arts accessible and inclusive for people with disability, some suggestions aside from what I mentioned before were that staff understand accessibility and disability info about accessibility provided before they get to the event, accessible venues and accessible transport, and that there are multiple ways to participate in the art. There are people with disability, um, and they also want people with disability working, performing or exhibiting at the event. 
and to see other people with disability participating and that people with disability can have input into adjustments or adaptations for them. Um, so nothing about us without us. And finally, two really important anecdotes came from the report. Arts are not optional extras. They make life worth living, said one person with disability. And I want to see accessibility to all events, knowledge of disability, issues by event organisers, staff and other participants, another person with disability. And these, these are just some of the results in that, from that survey. And um, they show just how important arts and inclusion is. And they're an excellent case for access and inclusion. So to start with, so, so now I've set the scene, I, I want to start by talking about, um, or, or asking the panel whether they have any further comments on that study. Um, I have to agree with this study. I think that it may, as a bookkeeper as well, it makes economic sense to have uh, performances that are accessible as well. Because obviously we're roughly 20% of the pie that you are missing out on. That means, you know, cash bums on seats kind of deal. So I think, and it is, it's a great experience for everyone. Art should be available to everybody to come along. So I think that, yeah, accessibility is the key. I just, um, I guess, thinking along the lines of, of assumptions and when we started working with Asphyxia and Queen Kong, Asphyxia is a deaf performer and she said to us um, that people assume that deaf people don't enjoy music, but we do, we love music. So um, I guess, uh, you know, adding on to that study, that idea about um, uh, being, being aware of different ways in which... Um, yeah, of breaking down assumptions, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So that accessibility, providing access in ways where you might not think um, first up that it would be desired. And yeah, the proof was in the pudding that people, they, the desire was 100% there. And I guess as a person, you want to see your own people on stage. You want to be represented. Mm. So, I mean, as growing up as a young person, I didn't see anyone who looked like me on stage or film or TV. And I think that um, it would be great to see things like that. Mm. I'm thinking about um, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in particular, how inaccessible the venues are there, um, because they're all older yeah. too, and how that really limits um, people's uh, audience access, but also performer access. So, yeah, and then I think about how those festivals um, also in regards to economic access because when you come to these uh, bigger venues that often do have lifts and um, certain, you know, access points required, the tickets are 50, 70, 80, 100 more. Mm -hmm. um, but a fringe festival is kind of where I know I can afford a ticket. Um, so it would be great if those fringe festivals were a bit more accessible and they thought a bit more about that. Yeah, we're going to talk a, a bit more about um, the lack of access for performers later on in this session. So thanks so much for raising that, Sarah. Um, the first thing I want to discuss is um, that embedding access. So the, this, the session today is about embedding access and um, embedding access is very different to providing access or maybe a little bit different. Um, I'm going to show some videos of um, Sarah Beck and Emma's performances soon, but I want to touch on what embedding accessibility means. Um, it's different to providing access as an add-on, and we're aware of an Auslan interpreter on the edge of the stage, as, as we've got now. Um, we're aware of closed captioning and wheelchair spaces, but what happens when access becomes part of the performance? When an Auslan interpreter interacts with the actor and becomes a character, when projected captions become part of the art design or the set design, it's a step beyond just providing access, and I think that artists and directors are just coming to terms with providing access. So these artists we've got on stage today really show that embedding access can be done and that um, with the right consultation and the time that's taken, um, it, it can be done. So we've got two videos now. We've got The first one is from Queen Kong um, last year. Yeah, um, it's a very – it's difficult because there's um, – we started with the concept of having three episodes and we um, we staged episode two first because it's a bit of a sci-fi thing to do uh, and also just a bit of a finger up to convention, which I really love. Uh, so it's called um, the, uh, the Legend of Queen Kong, episode two, Queen Kong in Outer Space. So it's a very long title. <laughs> So, no one's going to remember it. But, um, yeah, would, should we go to that, yeah. to that now? Hello, humans. 
I am the motherboard. The conduit of communication. The central processor. I hold information and allow for communication between all systems and life forms. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. We pay respects to their elders, both past and present. We celebrate their strong ongoing culture, the oldest living culture on planet Earth. The following story is a modern mythology, a queer tale, an abstract adventure. If any of our audience who are deaf or hard of hearing find themselves lost or confused, don't worry, nobody else understands either. Welcome to The Legend of Queen Kong, Episode 2, Queen Kong in Outer Space. Um, I want to discuss this with Sarah and Beck now when Sarah gets back on stage. Um, so tell us about the embedded access in your show. Sure. Um, so we it, this show um, took a bit of quite a lot of time, um, and that has been a good thing. So um, there's been a few sort of different drafts of it along the way, um, and we kind of kept changing how we're going to go about. We knew from the beginning that we wanted to make this show accessible. Um, and Asphyxia is a friend of ours. That's who you just saw on screen as a motherboard. Um, so it was great having that direct um, conversation with her. I think a, a big moment of us deciding how far we wanted to go with access was listening to Jess Tom. Um, she was being interviewed on um, Richard Watts' program, um, Arts. Smart Arts. And she said about um, that you know, we always think about in the arts that we're so um, open and inviting and progressive, yet um, we the, the door is not really open for a lot of people. And we've talked about it a lot before about financial access, but sort of taking that further. Um, so we wanted, at first Asphyxia came on board as a consultant because it, we'd had conversations with her before. She'd said, you know, when I come and see a show and it's, interpreted, that's great, but then I, I don't know where to look and I'm not seeing, watching the, the actor. Um, so we, um, she then moved into state, so that kind of was another another thing to, to deal with. So there was lots of emails backwards and forwards and then flying her down and having conversations. And then as we went deeper, we decided we can't do this show without having asphyxia in it because the access had become such a big part of the show and in fact, um, influencing the story was that we, as a group of hearing people, we can't put this show on ourselves. It's not right. Um, well, it's not just that it's not right. That show doesn't exist. You know, it can't, that show can't exist. So well, we did a version of it, didn't we, at the Adelaide Cabaret Festival, where it wasn't accessible at all, and it was about kind of. Um, me and my journey with my alter egos, that was the crux of it. And then we cake, we always wanted to make it accessible, but we didn't have the commission fun, funds to do that yet. And time. All the time. And then Dan Clark, who's like such a hero um, for um, artists and their dreams and visions and accessibility said, well, why don't we go for some funding within the art centre? Um, and then we got Ozco money and we got a little bit of funding here and there, including a friend of dear friend of ours who became our philanthropist. So it we that's the thing is it requires an incredible amount of money. Um, but Selene Bateman was also on our side from Auspicious Arts and she is a great contact for artists. And she was helping us with budgeting, but also um, a program. Can you remember the name of it? Because we might have to send it. Because Selene worked something out where we could... Um, There's a... I don't know if either of you may know the name of it, but there is... Or actually one of our interpreters may know. There is um, a fund. Um, so we were able to access... 
Yeah, EIF. That's it. So we were able to access money because in order to work with Asphyxia, every time we were um, working on translating songs or she needed an interpreter, obviously. And so that becomes, you're basically talking about two people's wages now. So we were able, because we were employing her for, I think it was over 105 hours, we were able to access um, funding to help pay for an interpreter. That's through the... The, uh, the, the federal government, Department yeah. of Social Services. Yes, yeah. Employment Assistance Fund. That's the one. That's the one. So, which is a really great initiative because it meant, you know, in some ways I guess we were in a position where we didn't have the funds to employ someone that was also going to require, um, you know, when, when you're talking about it becoming two wages. So, it was a really great resource um, for us. But what's fantastic about that too is that it is linked to you have to be employed for a certain amount of time. So, I think that's actually a a good thing about that fund is because it's in, it's encouraging it's encouraging employment and it's collaboration a, and collaboration mm. and um and so for us you know this by embedding access the idea was that we wanted it to enrich the show for everyone so it's it shouldn't be that um you know the access oh now it means that the deaf community can now come to our show but we're like but if we think about how we communicate surely that is going to be better for everyone and it's going to be better for us as artists. And I think also as an artist, um, you can be in your own bubble. So also have been put in a situation where you had to think about something from other, someone else's perspective. Again, that can hopefully only make the art better. So it's it's I a total win-win it situation. From Adelaide, um, we went into a process then of integrating asphyxia. <clears throat> And then we quickly realised that the, the dramaturgy of the show centred around me and my process with my alter egos was um, not going to work dramaturgically anymore. So we created a character for Asphyxia that you saw then on the screen called The Motherboard. So she's our information um, person but also a really funny character. There's a heightened version of her which is a little bit of um, sass and... Um, and um, kind of, what 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 what's the, the motherboard sort of vibe? It is so total. Well, it's sass, interesting because she's and she's the the you know conduit of communication and all this information. But sometimes she can't be bothered. That's it. So like I'm not you know pfft, that thing that scientific thing over there. Yeah. Um, and she really enjoyed that character. But I guess another point of access was that so we wanted her in the show, but Asphyxia also has um, chronic fatigue. So there, that's another um, thing that you're working with as far as I guess it's another disability in many regards. Yeah. Like it's a, something that's going to have an impact she had on to her. She lying down yeah. during the process and then we slowly realised she wouldn't be able to physically be in the show. So then we wanted her in the show so we filmed her instead. Because there was always going to be projections but maybe she would have only – she would have been half and half in the projections. Yeah, yeah and but so – Yeah, we discovered that through the process that, that her chronic fatigue was um, – she was hoping to be better – but she wasn't. So, um, and that's fine. It's just, sort of, it's it's about the one thing that I learned and it's, it's something that I've, I've always struggled with is patience and Beck is brilliant with patience and that's why she became so great at, you know, you taught yourself how to caption and how to use QLab and there were over 4,500 cues in QLab. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Not all operated, like timed. So. <laughs> timed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in some ways what ended up happening is that Beck, Beck has in some ways become um, someone that people – a resource for people to come to and say, how did you do that? Like, how did you teach yourself that? And how can I quickly get that knowledge to kind of create – to work, work in that way? Um, so that was a really, I think, one of the best outcomes – yeah, I actually got a whole new skill set out of it. So, that, again, I guess that's that thing about the win-win is that um, by being forced to think about things in a different way, you then have to find different ways to deliver those yeah. things. Um, and so, yeah, it's been for me a fantastic professional development with, along technology. I'm, I don't know if we're talking too long, but I just really quickly want to talk about the language of Auslan and how... Um, how much how educated I was uh, I'm going to really embarrassingly confess this and say I didn't actually know that Auslan was its own language I thought Auslan was just interpreting English so then I learned that Auslan was its own language with its own sentence structures and um, words that we don't even use in English um, like papa and so we did a we did a uh, yeah, we did a beginner's course with magic hands 
Beck, myself, and Salini, and then and Jen, and Jen, and Jen our, guitarist. our guitarist, and then the others did um, a, a little beginners course of their own, so that we could talk to people in the foyer and introduce them and talk, introduce ourselves and talk, and um, but also so we could change the script, like with yeah. consultation it, with asphyxia, it because really changed. not oh, yeah. like the actual sentence structure. There was one scene that we had to keep the English to make the joke work. The Auslan and the English were working in opposition to each other, otherwise the joke wouldn't have worked. But the actual structure of the show about what came first changed in order to work with Auslan sentence structure of topic first. And it improved our communication with each other. Oh my gosh, in the car, I'd be like, blah, 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 stop, topic. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it's a really um, amazing um, impetus, it was an amazing impetus for us to change the sense of the show. So dramaturgically, we we're in a place where we were really happy with because um, instead of, because sci-fi encourages you to, uh, or encouraged me to be more abstract, but then asphyxia encouraged me to be a more little precise. bit. Yeah, yeah, more precise. So then. Yeah. So then you can have the abstract. Exactly. You know? All of a sudden the abstract, there was an in for people because I think a lot of the feedback from Adelaide was I didn't really know what was happening, but it was fun. Whereas this one they were like, God, I really got that. And yeah, so it really learning Auslan um, a little bit, but learning how the language works and working in collaboration with asphyxia and always having her challenge us and because um, she's, she's really um, a, a great communicator, asphyxia. She's direct. Really direct. Yeah. Um, and I think that's how Auslan works a bit as a language as well. It's very direct. Yeah. Um, I, asphyxia doesn't say sorry a thousand times in a sentence, like me. Um, so, yeah. Um, it, it was just such a pleasure to work with her and also with Kiri and Alana um, Chanel Gelbart. Uh, Alana did the voiceovers and we worked really closely with her too and she um, worked with Asphyxia on the translations of the songs in particular, which often were quite difficult because there's a lot of pun and irony. Uh, so they had to really unpack that and sometimes they weren't singing exactly what we were saying lyrically, which is why we also had the captions. Mm -hmm. And then Asphyxia said, you should also, ha you know, the bass vibrations, we had them under the chairs so people could feel the music as well. Um, and then in the filming of the work, Beck created, um, what, what do you call those on your iPad? The uh, teleprompt. The teleprompt, yeah. So we had Ilana actually like Auslan prompting, but we also had the script in Auslan come up, not, not in not Yeah, in so I, I learned what asphyxia signs were and so as that I could um, time the scroll of the teleprompt because um, it wasn't going with the English, it was going with what her, her Auslan was, yeah. We learnt a lot. Great. We're still learning. <laughs> it's so good. We're doing a course um, with Magic Hands at the moment through Melbourne Fringe and uh, we have just employed Anna Seymour who's an amazing artist oh, and right. a dancer and so we're learning how to communicate better with both Anna and our Fringe artists and audiences and it's really fun. It's good and educative. Actually, I just wanted to add because I realised we probably should have said we also employed a stage manager who's from Fringe, Krista Jonathan, who um, she's uh, she signs. And it because in the end we didn't have asphyxia with us. We were looking for a stage manager who could sign so as they could communicate with asphyxia. But then once she wasn't on screen, we were like, hang on, let's just do this anyway because um, it's like people don't think about it unless they see it. So it, for us, it was really important to employ Krista so as that other people would think about it. Um, and so as moving forward, we had that relationship if there were deaf people on stage with us and it meant there was someone else. The more people in the room who could um, speak Auslan, that the better the communication was with the audience as well. And also for us, it meant we could keep going further with trying to learn the language as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so great. Krista's fantastic. Emma, we've got your video sure. from Take Up Thy Bed and Walk now. We'll watch that. Um, it goes for about five minutes. Get comfy. Get comfy.
Much. Amazing. Am I, amazing. Do you want to? I thought you'd break into song and dance there. <laughs> that was a good few years. That was about 2013, I think, when we created that show. Um, so that show was created uh, with Gail Mellis and Ingrid Verrent, who were very much about celebrating artists with a disability, particularly women. So that show had five women in it, and four of them had a disability, and we also had a Auslan interpreter who was also a performer. So she was embedded in the show right from the start, which was quite incredible. So we were all about creating the access right from the beginning. So even in the creative development, we were learning sign language and we were interpreting the songs and we were doing all the audio description way back from the start, which made it a bit of a lengthy process. So it took four years to get that show up and running in the end. but. Um, it was definitely worth it because I feel like it was in, integrated into the show so well and not just a tack-on measure. So um, we had Kira, um, Kyra Kimpton who had a visual impairment who was one of the performers. We had Jo Dunbar who now lives in Melbourne and she's a uh, deaf dancer and myself and also we had Michelle Ryan who is now the artistic director of Restless Dance Company. And Jerry Sheeran was our Auslan interpreter, so that was the five of us. And um, the kind of storyline was talking about how women with a disability back in the day were institutionalised, so that's why you might have seen us in the white nightgowns in the beds. So it talked about how um, women with a disability were obviously put into institutions back in the day, and it was about subverting the stereotypes. And that's kind of how we... Um, claim the spasticus autisticus song back for for disability people that it isn't a slur on the word that it's just about reclaiming the word as our word and like a rock anthem so um we had that at the end of the show and interestingly some people did get that that we were reclaiming it for ourselves and some people also didn't get the fact that we were reclaiming it and perhaps took offense that we were using that song so it was a little bit controversial at the time Interestingly, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, that yeah, it was it was amazing. I hadn't seen it before, and yeah, um, unfortunately, you didn't tour because it um, inevitably with these things, you know, it's financial and time, and also yeah, we burnt out in the end. Um, some, that's something we don't talk about necessarily in the disability arts sector, and maybe in the mainstream arts sector too. The fact that Creating work can take a lot out of people. And, yeah, <laughs> the burnout factor is quite high sometimes. So, um, unfortunately, it didn't get to tour because I think it was just such a great piece of theatre that at the time, back in 2013, there wasn't anybody doing integrated accessibility into shows. So, Yeah, it was fantastic. Thank mm. you. Um, I want to move on now to allyship. And Sarah and Beck have told me that um, you both don't identify as disabled but felt it really important to make your show accessible. Um, I think that there's an idea that people won't come if you make it accessible or I don't know anyone that is disabled or deaf. Um, so why, why did you want to be really great allies and make your show accessible? Um. Because we're really political by nature in the sense that we um, are always looking at how we can work toward equality across all sectors and all people, um, we thought what is the only um, kind of uh, point that is inaccessible currently 
particularly if we perform it here at the Arts Centre. Um, and that is that people who are deaf or hard of hearing um, just would not have access to it. And we thought in particular about queer, deaf and hard of hearing people because this show it is um, about celebrating difference um, and diversity, particularly around um, gender identity, sexuality. Um, and the artists involved, um, obviously Beck and I together, um, you can talk about your, your own identity, but um, I, I am a cis um, woman, but um, identify as queer or bisexual. And then we have um, uh, Cerise Howard, who is uh, a trans performer and writer and teacher. And Jen and Joe, who are both um, queer and, um, I'll, you know, I won't talk on, on their identity. They can talk for themselves at some point. But um, so, yeah, and we all got together and we created this show, which was... Um, looking at identity and looking at our relationship with ourselves, each other and the earth, yet we were thinking, oh, gosh, you know, like we just performed this at the Adelaide Cabaret Festival and it's, um, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you, yeah. though, because the idea was always to get the access I know, in there. It wasn't, it no, so it beginning. wasn't that we yeah. were, did it, we performed the show and went, oh, this isn't. We did That's a true. draft that was more about getting the song content together. It was um, because, like Emma was just saying, it takes time to do these things and ideally it would have, you know, if I could turn back time I'd probably would have had, I would have had asphyxia with us even earlier, like, you know, come in when we're writing some songs, even even earlier. But um, so, yeah, I just wanted to be clear that That's even though true. we yeah. did, a the draft was more about let's get the songs together, let's see which songs live in this show and then let's take it back into the rehearsal. Let's pull that script right apart and um, rewrite it based on... So all of the um, the script completely changed. The song stayed the same, um, but the script completely changed. By sorry to interrupt, but I just want to no, you're make right. that clear. Yeah, yeah. And then to to work with um, asphyxia because um, you know she, the provocation she said was that as we said before um, that she actually doesn't go to th much theatre anymore, and she knows a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people that don't even bother looking at programs. Or websites because they're like, well, it's not for me, so why would I bother? Um, that's really that that made me really um, ugh, it, it made me feel sad, angry, but also complicit <laughs> because every one of my cabarets, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't had accessibility for deaf or hard, hard of hearing people, and I know that Asphyxia would have loved them. Those shows, Yana, she's got a wicked sense of humour, and that's what we do, you know. Um, so when she said that she, when she goes to uh, a rock show or to a theatre show and she has to go like this and look at the um, Auslan interpreter here and the action's happening over here, that she finds that, you know, it's like watching tennis and she can often miss something over here. And, and also she's an incredible lip reader, so she would probably also like to be watching the performer. So, yeah, in the end she was really happy with the result, wasn't she? Yeah. But, I mean, I guess on this th the idea of allyship and about well, well, would anyone come, that was the thing that we kept saying is that if we just make this show accessible, we could make this show accessible and we'd feel really good about it. But if no one comes, what's the point? You know, so from the beginning, I guess part of this whole idea about embedding access is about embedding access to the marketing as well. So is that people had to know what was happening. Um, and I guess ongoing from that, we have we will never perform as Queen Kong the band without at least having an interpreter on stage with us because, oh, sorry, the band's Queen Kong and the Homo Sapiens. So even if it's not the show, if we've invited an audience in, we can't then say, oh, but not this one. So it's about, so part of that, otherwise all we did was made ourselves feel good. You know, we didn't actually provide access because, oh, we made one show accessible and then we moved on. But to me, that's that's not access. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it, it is so important to promote your show and market your show as access, as an accessible show. And from the start and, um, you know, in, in our Fringe Producers Guide to Access, we've got a lot of tips in there around um, making sure you both work with the Auslan interpreters well in advance in the rehearsal room, but also um, working with them in the promotion of the show. So making a video uh, with an interpreter or a deaf person or a hard of hearing person to show that you're inclusive from the start, telling the communities that your show is 
um, you know, in, uh, inclusive and accessible because it's not only about making the physical accessibility prominent, it's about making people feel welcome and comfortable to come and also taking feedback when you when you don't do such a great job in accessibility yes. as well. Yeah. Um, I want to talk now to Emma and, and I guess I'm in the same in the same boat. We both identify as disabled and one of the hard things I have, um, particularly on my book tour where, uh, you know, as I said before, outside of Fringe I work as a freelance artist and um, I didn't have the luxury and I'm when I say luxury I say it tongue in cheek of turning up and talking because I had to not only talk about my book but do the access and I expected that the bookstores and the publishers would do that but it was on me because I knew and they didn't know and other authors don't don't even consider it so that was a really big learning curve for for the publishers and the bookstores and so Emma as a disabled artist sometimes it can be more onerous to educate in the access what we need or what our audience needs as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, because access is also for performers being on stage and backstage as well. And you'd be surprised how many theatres, even the big ones, aren't accessible backstage. So, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting that they can fit a 20-foot gorilla into a really big theatre, but having a disabled person on stage, not so much so. I've known people that have to go through the few foyer of the theatre, they have to get put up on a lift and then get on the stage. And this is all in front of the audience. So, I mean, it kind of breaks the fourth wall, absolutely, to start with. So there's crazy stuff that, like that that happens. Mm. And I've been in big theatres where there's a fire door and the fire doors are way too heavy for me to open. So if I, like, miss my cue, I'm, like, stuck behind this fire door, not being able to get onto stage. So, yeah, it's just crazy things like that, try to manage it. Mm. I think there's an idea that um, disabled people and deaf and hard of hearing people um, can be at the audi in the audience, if that, uh, if access is provided, but never on stage. Oh, so, abs yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was um, presenting at Melbourne Uni a few weeks ago and I was talking all about my work as an access and inclusion coordinator and, and writer and speaker and I looked around and I noticed that they would never have a um, person in a wheelchair presenting on you know, as in, ele in lecture form, unless they were standing at the back of the room because there was no way Absolutely. for people and to get down. Absolutely, sometimes you can't get on stage in a, with a wheelchair at all yeah, for right. speaking events like that. And, yeah, there's an and idea. And casting, I've been to auditions where it's in a room upstairs. So if you were in a wheelchair, there's no way you could audition for that role. So you're just cut out from the picture because you can't actually access the casting mm. to get the audition, to get the role. So it's like you stopped right at the start. The door, yeah. 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 I think there's an idea that we can't lead. And I think Beck and Sarah are really showing that um, deaf people, asphyxia, has led in, in your performance and Emma. And that you're artists in your own right, you're professionals and you're good at what you do. There's still this stigma out here that disabled artists aren't actually very good at what we do, that we're somehow lower than everybody else. Mm. So not, I don't, don't think it's true at all. I think all types of artists should be able to be on stage. Yeah, yeah, great. And, and also that's why we need allies as well to, to help do the work. Yeah, we're all about diversity. We don't want to cut the normal people off. <laughs> we, we don't want to take over completely. <laughs> it's space for everyone, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm going to talk about the importance of embedding access from the start, not just as an add-on. And I see um, artists that really are excited about providing access but then when they hear how much it costs. So an Auslan interpreter yeah. is between $70 and $120 an yeah. hour and generally you need two for a minimum booking of two hours and um, audio description can be about $1,200 a show. Um, relaxed performances are around $150 a consultation a consultation plus the show. So it, it costs and you have to budget for that. And um, when you embed it from the start when you think of access as the same as communication marketing as the same as venue hire as the same as fees for your artists and crew then I think that shows that you're really committed so why why is it so important to embed it from the start and not as an add-on not as an afterthought I would say one of the factors is time because if you don't think about it from the beginning, you're not going to give yourself enough time. Because it's funny, we had people say to us, I mean, why don't more people do this? I mean, it's easy. And we're like, well, it kind of wasn't easy, yeah, no. you know, like it it was great, 
but it required money and it required time. So I think even like on a purely practical level, you can't decide at the last minute you're going to do that. It's just, it's not going to work. But also um, to make the, the art better, <laughs> you know, like, know that's not a very great, it's not a good sentence. But so, so as there's not two different things going on stage at the same time, there is one thing and, um, and everything is moving your story forward. For me, that's that's why I think it's important. I want to read a quote um, on this topic from Julie McNamara or Julie Maccus, as, or Maccus, as some of you might know. Julie's a friend of mine and she's a performer from the UK. Um, she is an honorary fellow at VCA Theatre. She's also the artistic director of Vital Exposure. She came out here um, in a, to Australia this year for about three months and she did a, a lecture at Melbourne Uni. Um, and she said this really great thing which I wanted to talk about today, which is related to embedding access from the start. In the UK, we spell disability with a capital D, says McNamara. We've reclaimed disability because it's all about how we do our th how we do things our own way. She describes the appalling way that lip service is paid to audience members with a disability, whether it's through the use of clunky su um, subtitles or interpreters virtually hidden in the wings. They've got somebody at the side or a, a bit of a test there. Uh, sorry, a, a bit of a test of the stage text. The hideous lights of many productions are a particular kind of hell for people like Mac have an acquired brain injury. It's so clunky, so uncomfortable, so awkward, laments Mac. Your brain, if you're deaf, if you're deaf, is constantly playing catch up. There's an assumption that the person is the problem because they bring disabilities with them, that something about them doesn't work, but it's the system that's failing. And that's why Mac talks about disability-led theatre in terms of access aesthetics. Not only does she aim to put extraordinary marginalised stories centre stage, she strives for an inclusive aesthetic that integrates accessibility at the heart of the of her work. So her work means that um, she's got captions on the screen as part of the set and, and um, she talks a lot in her lecture about um, the importance of slow and she works with a, um, a woman um, who is, uh, has a cognitive disability and this woman pulled her up on the idea that there's nothing wrong with being slow so she wants to um, take note of being slow uh, in her movements in her speech so that everybody can understand and that was a really great thing to, to hear from Julie. Um, if you google Julie Mack um, or Uni in Melbourne you can find some really great stuff that she's done but I thought that quote was or that um, excerpt from the article was really pertinent to what we're discussing today. Emma do you have anything on embedding access from the start? I just think um <laughs> Not only can it can be part of the creativity as well, so that you actually learn new things from being able to put access in so early on. I, I know I learnt so much. I didn't really know much about tactile tours when I first started doing um, Take Up Thy Bed and Walk, and that's so that people can come and feel the set and touch the pe set pieces and things like that. So even I'm learning, and they how it kind of shaped how the whole show was discovered. I just think... It just allows for great flexibility in how you make a piece of work. And um, that, you know, everybody can then watch the show. If you're elderly, you might, that you could get something out of that too. If you can't see, there's lots, like it just kind of opens it up to everybody mm. in such a great way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that when you embed access for, for performers and for audience members, it can make every, like, the idea of seeing yourself, like mm. you were saying before, it can make the audience or um, other actors or performers more comfortable in asking for what they need as well because I feel very awkward about asking for a chair, but then if the chair is provided to someone else, then I'll be more yeah, comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the performers in the show had a problem that she was really scared she might go to the toilet, be desperate to go to the toilet during the show. So we actually just worked out a bit where we're like, if this happens, you do this gesture, and then we, we just had this moment in the show that we could stop the show and she'd go to the toilet. Like, so you don't make anything wrong. It, everything's okay. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. It never yeah. happened, so it was great. But we just had this backup plan in case she needed to go to the toilet. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit now from leading up, leading off from what um, Julie Mack said and um, 
the aesthetics of access. One, one thing I found really lovely w with your performance, Sarah and Beck, was the um, the zine that came with your performance. So there's a zine on everybody's seats that you can have a look at. Um, the zine, Emma, there's one down yeah, there. Yeah, I had a read earlier. <laughs> okay, great. Um, the zine was art in itself and mm. I've seen some uh, relaxed performance or um, accessibility information on, you know, attached to performances or performance information and it hasn't looked great and that and that's fine as you said it takes a lot of work and it's a lot of money to produce collateral and things so I was really impressed with this it it incorporated asphyxia's artwork as well did it it's actually not asphyxia's artwork oh. no it's, it's um it's Minori Pires who worked with us right from the beginning mm -hmm. but asphyxia was a part of you know, consultation on the zine. Mm. And I think everybody wanted it to be visually exciting because why should it be droll, you know? Why should it be boring? Um, access can be exciting and fun. And I also think if we had have had the money, we would have been able to put Braille inside it too, oh, which is yeah, the we dream. we talked about it. But oh, that's wow. the dream. So ne next time yeah. we do it, and, we, and Deb's here too, our friend who was going to help us on that. <laughs> but unfortunately, we just didn't have the, the money or the time to, to make that happen. But um, that is it, something we'd like to do next time, yeah. You can but get it, one of those Braille printers and you could like print them just... Yeah, and yeah. It'd be cool. it'll right. take ages though. Yeah, you right. need to it's employ another person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. and I guess it's again back to that thing about uh, you know the, the access should be great. Should I think it can be done in a way that it is useful for everyone. So mm. the, the information in that zine is essentially what wouldn't be needed to be provided for relaxed performance. Mm. So we were really lucky. The art centre supported us, and we had regular meetings, and we could kind of. You know, because we, we, we're still learning. So yeah. so just to have assistance in what to put in there. But then, okay, so let's do that. But let's not just have it for the relaxed performance. Let's have it there all the time and everyone um, can have access to that and just find another entry point to the show. Yeah, I, I do want to thank the Arts Centre at this point because we, we, we did have big... We had quite a few meetings um, and the access team here are incredible and made it happen. Um, and back and forth with us, you know. Um, but I think it's also useful. This is the thing is that, um, you know, somebody like me. Now, I, I suffer from quite a lot of anxiety. I, I have chronic anxiety. So for me, being able to sit and read and get a sense of the show and what it's going to... That, that means something to me. That mm. makes my show more relaxed. Mm. So we made sure that these were accessible for every show, mm. not just for, you know, so this... Yeah, not for just yeah. for the relaxed performance. And I know now... Uh, I just got an email today, actually, from a fringe artist who is looking at making their show accessible and I will send them your example Amazing. of Yay. information. Yeah. Emma, do you have anything to say on the aesthetics of access? Um, yeah, like Beck said, it doesn't have to be boring and dry. It can be exciting and, like, we had lots of bass in our music, so, we, like, we had a thumping kind of rock anthem in our show. I just thought it didn't have to be all droll and so access is exciting. And I just, like, the, you know, pipe dream that all shows everywhere are accessible. I mean, imagine what that would look yeah, like. Exactly. It would be incredible, exactly. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. I saw Sarah Hallbolt's um, show last year, Cuckoo the Bird Girl, which was uh, um, at Northcote Town Hall and it, Sarah was part of the Darabin yeah. Speakeasy, or oh, sorry, your platform um, program and um, she had all the warnings for her show and um, I think, I'm not sure whether all the shows were Auslan interpreted, but the warning was like it contains um, power tool usage because <laughs> she used a power tool in the show That's great. on her crotch even. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the warning was quite alarming but useful. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I was researching all, your, all of your shows and, and for this, I, I was looking at the reviews because sometimes, and I've found it as well for, for my own work, um, particularly with my book, sometimes people don't get access or they don't get disability and um, some of the reviewers can be ableist or... or or um, I guess discriminatory uh, or just not clued in to the purpose or the benefit of access. Um, I did – all of the reviews were amazing for your show and they all 
commented on access. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read two reviews now. I'm going to read one of Queen Kong. Time Out said that the major theme is not just of inclusion, but the boundless potential of humanity and its great capacity for change. The presence of live Auslan interpreter on stage, as well as an access consultant in the credits, proves that it isn't merely lip service. That the creative team are walking the walk. And of Take Up Thy Bed and Walk, Glam Adelaide said this performance is generous, inviting, moving, touching, heartwarming and extremely inclusive. Aside from an Auslan interpreter, there, was, there were screens on which text appeared, there was recorded dialogue and the music had plenty of bass which could be felt by those who could not hear. So I thought that the reviews were great and I really worry that we have a range of reviewers who aren't disabled, who aren't in the access and inclusion space that are reviewing our work but it's also important to get critical reviews. What do you say about reviews and access and inclusion? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. You got thoughts? Um, yeah, you're thinking. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because for us, you know, a, a point of um, a moment that was really clear that made us want to add the access was actually a reviewer, Richard Watts, interviewing someone. So there's, so I guess there are people, I would, I think Richard is a, is a good advocate, um, is an ally. Um, and he is, uh, he's an example of someone that from what I can see is trying to gather more knowledge. Like he wrote an article about, um, about relaxed performances um, for Arts Hub. Mm -hmm. So so you, I, I guess you just hope there's more people. I think it people. depends on the reviewer too. Uh, but, yeah, because yeah. Richard Watts is obviously a keen supporter already. But um, yeah. I just, yeah, thinking that whether it would, it was more from audience members actually than reviewers. I remember when I did take up a Thy Bed and Walk because I'm quite well known as a cabaret light entertainment type person. So when I did something a bit more heavy hitting politically, um, some people found that a bit more difficult to take from me because I was getting a bit more serious. And I was, that was when I started owning the word disabled artist and that I, I identified as that for myself. So um, just interesting that somehow people don't always come along for the ride with you when you're trying to re-identify yourself as an artist. But I think there's power in the words and owning being an artist with a disability. So. I, I, so just to add to that, I think we've got a problem with reviewers because everybody thinks they're a reviewer and bloggers and, and can do it. And anyone can be. <laughs> and anyone can. You can review even on Facebook now. Yeah. You can say, I didn't think this was very great. In fact, I did that for my friends in um, Edinburgh, their show, Casting Off, is it? Yeah, great show. Um, really age-inclusive and exciting uh, physical theatre work. Um, you know Deb? Deb... Um, and Deb Button, yeah, and Spencer, and yeah, Sharon. So they did this show and I said, oh, God, I love this show. This is all women and feminism and, and body positivity. And so I said, five stars, Yana Alana. And they actually printed it and put it on all their posters. Um, so I think we, ha we have to start, because the system isn't working for us, we have to make it work for us now. So if it's broken, let's go with it. Let's fix find it, people that can review and just, like, make up something if you need to. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, I really think it's broken now. There's only, what, like, one, two, maybe three places that, you know, the Herald Sun, the Australian, the Guardian, got heaps the of reviews. Age. There's, like, a whole page of reviews that yeah, I put in our Yeah, but one notes. of them was, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good. I yeah. hate it when you get stars. But it, it is the thing. I think yeah, people right. forget that it, it's an actual, it's a skill. You know, mm. it's, like, even though everyone can have an opinion, an actual Solid mm. review. And maybe the thing is that the more access is embedded into shows, it will become something normal that isn't strange for reviewers. And not that, to comment on. That perhaps are weirded out by it. I yeah. don't know. Maybe their brains have to work too hard. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. they just don't know what it's yeah. like. It's not experiential for them. They haven't mm. or they haven't had experience with someone with a disability. So they're like, why should I have to watch someone Auslan interpret or something? <laughs> I don't understand these people, Carly. I don't understand. The reviewers? Yeah, yeah. those ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a wrap-up soon with questions around what's next from us, but I want some questions from you in the audience now. Um, if we can – someone have the mic so it picks up as well. If we can give up one of the mics, yeah. please. Thank you. We've got lots. Gosh. That's good. <laughs> okay, up, up the back. Yep. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, talking about um, um, embedding access from the start, 
if uh, an able-bodied performer or producer wanted to do a collab, like collaborative work with people or artists with disabilities, is there agencies or um, organisations where you can access people or artists with disabilities yeah. to work and collaborate together and to add um, embed access from the start? There's probably a couple of places you can go to. There's Arts Access, which is an organisation here in Victoria who would know artists with a disability. Um, the Equity now has a performer with disability committee, so you could talk to MEAA. Great. Um, also, there's an agent called, who's my agent, called ICACM. That's their um, abbreviation. And they have artists with a disability. Um, yeah, so there's a few different... Play or Deaf Australia, there's... You, right. Carly probably knows a good for you too. Yeah, and I also think it's about getting out and seeing the work. And I, I get all of my work. I, I'm not a performer. I, I sometimes perform, but I, I'm not. That's not my main work. But I get all of my writing work, my speaking opportunities through word of mouth, and it's generally through people who have come and seen me, come to see me yeah. speak before, yeah. who and have it's asked me. Finding maybe a good fit because you know you don't always. It's about finding yeah. someone that you yeah. like their work and what they're yeah. doing. I yeah. guess as well as a producer and. Um, I get a lot of queries on my from my Facebook page to, uh, you know, ask for castings or, you know, promote a show. And one of the things that I always request is can you make this information accessible? There's no point in sending me a picture that then I have to image describe. So image description is where you put what's happening in the image in your text caption um, so that people with screen readers or people that um, have sensory conditions can read them. Um, and so if they send it in an, in, an accessible, in an inaccessible format, then it's a lot of work for me. So make it really clear and accessible um, for us to promote. There are a number of casting agencies that I've heard, but again, I think that they're somewhat inaccessible and also that it's really great when disabled people get paid. So make sure your event is a paid thing. Yeah, you'd be surprised well. how many times we get asked <laughs> to do things for absolutely nobody. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's the arts <laughs> yeah. in general. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Who else had a question? There was some more. There's one over here. Hi, I'm just curious about, um, you mentioned right at the start about leadership and needing leadership skills. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, what would that be? Um, I think it's about leadership opportunities because I think yeah. we have leadership skills. So we're proving that today. Oh. Um, but I think that there is an assumption that disabled people don't have leadership skills and that we can't act in leadership roles. And, and so also there aren't, well, in the major arts companies, there are, I don't believe there are any leaders with a disability that I'm aware of as well. So, well, no, oh, is Arts it? Access oh, Victoria Arts Access. has the lovely Caroline I think I'm Bowditch. just thinking of the big, the, yeah, big theatre yeah. companies, I guess I'm thinking But of. it's about yeah. giving opportunities like mentorships and paid opportunities and ways to work up the ladder. At Melbourne Fringe, we, uh, we've employed, they've employed me, which is great. Um, but again, that, you know, that, that's an entry level position um, and they've, um, employed, we've employed Anna Seymour, and there's also um, opportunities for mentorships through uh, for artists um, in Fringe Festival, and um, that was through the Victorian government um, created Victoria's Talent Matters program, which um, or it might have been through the other arm of the Victorian government, the Disability Employment Arm, um, and that put uh, that gave two people or or a years or two years worth of employment to and a producer that is disabled. And I know that um, there's other opportunities that have gone to other arts organisations like Writers Victoria running the publishability program. But there just needs to be spots and paid spots, not just at the entry level. Um, the Disability Leadership Institute talks a lot about this. That's not an arts organisation but a disability-led leadership organisation. They talk about how it needs to be more than just entry level. Um, yeah. And like maybe more consultancy work, paid consultancy yeah. work. And I think for mm. me, uh, even though I work at Fringe, I, I did that for two and a half days a week and the rest of my time is freelancing. And um, the places that I, you know, that I work uh, hire me as a, as a consultant. And I used to work in the government for a very long time and I feel like I'm now, if I, um, you know, equate that kind of work to what I did in the government, I'd be earning... Uh, earning and working at much higher level than I did when I was in the government doing this consultancy work. Mm. So is the paid consultancy work in other countries for disabled people that you, where you could follow that model? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Um, yeah. There's some great disability-led uh, organisations and people. I think um, you just have to really get online and follow people. I share a lot of people through my own social media, through Carly Finlay on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and the Disability Visibility um, Project shares a lot of people as well, Disability mm-hmm. Leadership Institute, yeah. It's sure. a, but it is about you um, researching and, and following along and um, becoming in, interested and involved in the community and getting out and seeing the art as well. And making connections with people that perhaps you want to work with and knock on doors. If you can reach the door handles, go through the door. <laughs> <laughs> Climb in a window, <laughs> go in the back door, whatever you can do. <laughs> yeah. Any comments from you two? Yeah, I, I, I think there's some exciting things happening in the UK. Um, and yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not so much about leadership, but um, I did some research because we wanted to go to the UK and I came across, I'd already, we'd made some connections with the, um, the what's it called, Royal Theatre, ah, Glasgow. Sorry, I'm not, I can't, my brain can't find the name of the theatre, but in Glasgow. And there is a course there, there, it's a theatre course um, for um, deaf and hard of hearing people. So it's it's um, yeah, it looks. Um, I, I want to go there. I want to go and and meet the artists and see their productions. Um, it just looks fantastic. So it's you know a course very much like what you would see at VCA or NIDA, mm-hmm. but it's um, all around training, like rigorously training deaf performers um you know I, I guess that it's that thing about like saying yes these people are um the leaders and they are um talented and that you know I guess I guess it's like it's not an add-on not an add-on yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I know that um Caroline Bowditch was saying at Creative State a couple of weeks ago that in the UK there's quotas and if you apply for a grant you have to put access on your grant so that um, the government gives them money to make their shows accessible. I think that, you know, and we really stressed today how much it costs to make your show accessible. Mm. Um, I did a show last year, an event, and Emma was the MC. I did a fashion parade at Melbourne Fashion Week and um, the most of the money went to, to access, to access mm. paying the um, Auslan interpreters and also paying all the performers and models and Emma. And yeah, it, it's really important. So we need the funders to get mm. behind us and see it not as a project but a core funding. Mm. Yeah. Got a question up here at the front. We'll just wait for the microphone. Oh, I, 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 oh, oh no, for the access, oh, we need sorry. a micro- microphone. Sorry. Um, you, you mentioned it sort of more at the start and then also just then it reminded me again. Um, in terms of, like, ticket prices and people being able to come and see shows obviously needs to be made more accessible financially, but then um, it's sort of the cost of putting on a show for super independent um, people um, and the cost that sort of that entails. So, for example, um, I'm doing a French show and um, we've got we're going to have two... Auslan interpreter performances and that's one of the more expensive parts, parts of the budget and because of that we had to increase the ticket prices in order to cover our sort of minimum if we want to break even 30 percent do you sort of have any advice on I don't know like what's too expensive or I don't know the best way to go about it or from going right from the get-go we want to include these things but then obviously making it accessible to the people who we want to come and see the show. And I know that people with disabilities, like, often earn can earn less money and artists can earn less money. That's yeah. where I think those things were, like, two for one night, sort of. That's, yeah. that's mm-hmm. So if you make sure... I mean, it means that it's not accessible financially every night, but making sure that there is a night where people on a low income yeah. can, can, come. can yeah. come. And there's companion cards that you can add to your um, booking so someone that has a um, support person can bring along that support person for free. Um, and, and like Sarah, I think Sarah mentioned it earlier, but marketing to the right areas and yeah. making sure that you get the deaf community to know about your show and things yeah. like that. And also you might make the ticket sales back, you know, you might make the Auslan cost or whatever other accessibility provision back on ticket sales if you market to the right people and yeah. the people come. Um, uh, I, I, it's a little bit different, I guess, but when I did my my book tour, I, I've, um, 
live streamed a number of them and recorded a number of them. So for those who were bed bound or couldn't get there, um, they could see that later or listen to it later and um, I haven't had the time to transcribe but I will do soon and upload them all and I also worked with the Wheeler Centre and Writers Victoria and my publisher for the Melbourne launch in providing six tickets for free I think um, yeah so six yeah and, and that included the book in there as well I know for people who couldn't financially afford to come because I said I want people to be able to come and also be confident in asking for that ticket as well. Yeah, we um so our sort of venue producer, the group called Camp Conscious, and so they we didn't sort of even think of this thing. They suggested for us to hold some free tickets per night or a pay as you feel, pay as you can or pay as you feel or something like this, mm. and then also having the um a, a separate section on fringe that's like a low ticket income price. So I think that's a conversation they were going to have with ticketing, but that also might be a conversation that you would then have with them in terms of like the actual ticket. Uh, options that you can list on your event or, yeah. yeah. Big, That's not really a question, sorry. It was just <laughs> information. I think financial access is a big thing. Mm, it's and, huge, and I it's think, huge, yeah, and um, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of places the concession price is like $4 cheaper. Yeah. It's like that was set by someone who's never needed concession. Yeah. yeah. Because they've got no idea, the yeah. va- you know, what someone else drops on taking their mates out for dinner is someone else's weekly income. So, um, yeah, so when there is a concession price, we feel strongly that it should be a significant... Yeah. 10 to $15 yeah. cheaper. But also, yeah. also, we did this thing at Fringe, which, which worked really well for us because we were in the Lithuanian club in the main sort of space. So I think there was about a 250-seater or 300-seater if you open the top. So we did this thing where we had um, a, a preview on the Tuesday where we only charged something like 15, 10, 15 bucks. Yeah. And then we had a Wednesday which was like, we know we're not going to get many people in there anyway, so let's make it accessible for people. And we did it pretty much the same price but we called it something. Do you know what I mean? Like we gave it a title and then we sold it to the fringes, this great idea, you know. And they were like, cool. And then we sold so many tickets, wow. so many more than we would have at a, at a higher awesome. price. So it worked really well for us, well, for the festival, for the people and financially it really worked. So you kind of think about... Uh, you know, like tricky little ways that you can make it accessible financially. Yeah. Was that like a, a, a discount code or something you had for that Wednesday show? Or no, what? we just made the price. We made the price right, yeah. in the program. Having a tied up Tuesday. Yeah. 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 And yeah. the uh, Fringe Festival also runs um, discounts. Um, I'm not sure what they are this year, but there's, there's Fringe Dweller, which is like if you become a member, mm. and then there was this last year they had the Take 5 Bank of Melbourne uh, no, Bank of Australia, sorry, um, scheme where I think um, the bank paid $5 and then the uh, art, the audience member got $5 yeah, off yeah, but it yeah, didn't take away from the box office yeah. fee that you that an artist would get. Yeah. So I'm not sure this year. You'll have to have a look when the program launches but there's those options. Mm. And when you promote your show to, an, uh, to your audience, let them know about these discounts as well. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you. That's right. Any other questions? One here and one at the back. Thank you. I wasn't sure if it was going to get passed further back or not. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in regards to reviewers. We just touched on it before. Um, for and for marketing to people with disabilities, there's a whole lot of different communities and sub-communities within that big banner, obviously. Do you have any uh, recommendations of people that we could approach within that community that could you know, review a show yeah. at a dress rehearsal or preview for awesome. them? Yeah, great question. Um, I get heaps of review requests through my, my blog and email and um, I often can't do them. So I will pass them on to people. I run a group called um, Disabled Writers or Australian Disabled Writers and, um, and I always send that on if people want to do them or not. Um, You could send them to Quippings. You know, Quippings is the disability performance troupe in Melbourne. Um, I'm a member of Quippings, although I haven't done a show for a long time. Um, But I guess just – and send them to Arts Access Victoria as well. If you include the the ticket, um, one of the things I have found is that um, some disabled people aren't really familiar about where to connect with review – publications so if you know of places that you would like the show reviewed in or you know say you could you could um ask could you review this show and then maybe say if you want to do it on your blog or arts hub or 
through time out but um, I would say, or, or even a Facebook post if you're happy with that. Um, I do a bunch of reviews around the comedy festival and I mostly put them on my Instagram now because that's where people see your review. I don't write for any particular website. So if you're happy with their, their own Facebook page, that could be good. Any other suggestions? Richard Watts is always a big supporter of disability art or yeah. any cool art really. Yeah. So he's always open to things. Mm. We, we felt very much like we didn't want to care that much about what the mainstream reviewers thought. So we put a big whiteboard out the front oh, in the foyer. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And we were, we were encouraging people to write their own reviews, particularly yeah. hopefully from the deaf and hard of hearing community because we thought they're the ones we're going to post about. Yeah. Well, who cares what Cameron Woodhead thinks? But actually, to a point, that was also for us for our own... Um, Feedback and yeah, things. because yeah. that was one of the things we're like, we got to be prepared for like the onslaught of oh, that didn't work, and that you know, and because that was for us as artists, we wanted that as well is yeah, to help progress the work. Well, interestingly, I think maybe it's that thing about only, only people who had positive feedback wrote, yeah, wrote yeah. up there, you know, and drew pictures and oh. Oh yeah, so so we because we really actively sought feedback. So you know there was conversations around um, native um, Auslan speakers as opposed to, to learning Auslan later in life. So that was things for us to think about. Um, and um, did you have something else you're thinking in particular that no, you want to meet? Mainly about that. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a question up the back in the right. Hello, thank you so much for what you shared today. I found it really, really interesting and insightful. Um, I uh, I run a co-founded a small production company um, based in Gadigal Land up in Sydney, and um, we. Um, I just want to kind of like add on to that question about reviewers. Um, we found earlier on in our practice that a lot of the reviewers were um, miscategorizing and misinterpreting our work, and um, because all of our artists are um, female identifying, black and brown identifying Indigenous women. Um, we found that really problematic. And um, as a result, to kind of protect our performers, we stopped inviting people from outside to review and asked our community to, um, to, our community to review in their own words. And so I was wondering, um, in terms of embedding access, um, are there, is there anything that um, either of you, any of you have used to kind of... Um, to protect your performers from potential um, critique or criticism from or misunderstanding from people who, who come and view your work? That's a really great yeah. question, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'd, as a performer, like in my occasional performing in quippings or other things, um, I ha we, we have never discussed that. But as a writer, um, I get reviews of my book and I would say the most the like the one stars are the most ableist um like um someone wrote the other day that my 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 life story it's a memoir it, it makes them feel better about their own health um early on <laughs> early early on in my um when I when I first published the book in January there was a person on the Goodreads that said um, that they thought that my face was airbrushed and um, and that I wasn't a true representation of myself. And my agent said generally she would say never to respond to the reviews, but in this case I set them straight and I said I was very clear with the photographer about what I wanted and the publisher and no, this, this isn't like airbrushed and my face was good on that day and all that. And I, I mean I shouldn't even had to. But, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. And I think you have to talk to your performers around not reading the reviews or only reading the good ones. And also that um, Brene Brown quote, um, also Eleanor Roosevelt maybe, uh, if you're not in the arena getting your ass kicked, I don't want your feedback, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky. Uh, yeah, I've just been thinking about that question and, um, yeah, when you identify as something and you label yourself as that and then your show gets labelled with that as well, it comes with this weighty context to it. So I do understand where you're coming from. But it's it's difficult because who reviews the reviewers? Nobody does. So basically it's really tricky that you'll get the right type of person to your show and will understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. 
and the context that it's coming in. So, yeah. I think if it's from your own community, it's Maybe, or, or yeah, the community yeah. you're trying to target, that's a really great thing. Um, I have I have actually gone back to people. I got a tweet this morning actually from someone in England who, let, who wrote something really nice about my book and I just messaged them and said, hey, if you want to, could you consider putting that on Goodreads, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can relate to this for, as a queer feminist artist um, and I think that um, some of the reviews, um, you know, as soon as you start reading them you go, ah, okay, um, cis white man. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And, and then you've got to read it and then you look at the bottom and you're like, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you didn't. You didn't understand. You can't understand. Um, and so then, that kind of helps take the three stars with a grain of salt. Ah, uh, but you know, you use those things so that you can get the word out there. So then it is really hard when a major paper gives you three. Two, actually, I'd prefer two or one. I really would. Three hurts so much more. Three is like middle road. Middle road. Three is like I don't care. You know what I mean? And which is the worst when you're creating really political, accessible work, you know, and it's just like you want to go, what would you know, and then blah, blah, blah. But it's like at the end of the day, that's the one that goes nationwide. That's the one that everybody reads. Mm -hmm. And then um, all of this time and work and effort and they don't care. But I, would, but I would add to that. I guess it's like what you're saying about you're getting reviews from within your community and I have heard of other <laughs> companies doing that. But I think people who read reviews a lot are also aware, oh, that's a review from so-and-so. So, that, so you, you know you're reading, yeah. you, like if you read enough reviews, you're reading it with that lens on. That yeah. you, so you might go, oh, he hated it. I'm going to love it. I'm definitely going to see that. Because you start to, you know, <laughs> if you read enough reviews, you start to know where people's line. Yeah. Is yeah. I think reviewing from when the community is where it's at at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wrap up questions now. If if there's any others, maybe ask at the end. Um, that was really great. But I want to show you a performance that I went to see that was amazing, and I can't stop thinking about it. Um, um, we'll get the video playing in a minute. But I was in Perth, and I, I was a speaker at the Perth Festival earlier this year. And the producer said to me, "Hey, Carly, we know you're at Melbourne Fringe. You should come and see our performance, which is one of the key performances at the festival called The Nature of Why." And Caroline Bodich um, from Arts Access directed this, uh, choreo choreographed it actually, and um, someone from Goldfrapp is involved as well. Um, so I attended this, and I was asking all of my, you know, my, my publisher was with me, and a couple of other speakers. And I said, do you want to come to the orchestra tomorrow? And they're like, no, it'll be so boring. And then, um, anyway, so it was really hard to, hard to give the tickets away. And I found two friends to come and they were so amazed and it was so incredible. And I went back to my publisher and I said, you missed out. And uh, they were very sad because I showed them the video on Facebook afterwards. Um, Jess Walton came with me. Jess is an amazing writer. She wrote, she wrote the episode of Get Crackin', the disability episode, yeah. And um, Emma was in that as well. I know. Um, so Jess wrote this really great piece for Witness um, online and she said, at one point a dancer hold, held my hand and we moved together. They didn't realise I had a prosthetic leg but as they felt me struggle with my balance, they adjusted their movements and, be and their movements became smaller, gentler, slower. That generosity Krogan describes that fluid sense of exchange made it possible for two strangers to come together in dance and to find ways to move together it was like a conversation between two bodies and it was beautiful when they let go of my hand and moved toward another person I found myself still dancing euphoric with joy and wonder so we're going to watch the nature of why now it was incredible and it really showed how access can be embedded when you explain it a why you have to be in some framework that you allow something to be true.
So that was really participatory. So we were all on the stage with those performers, with the musicians and the dancers. You can come back on now. Um, and it was so incredible. We just felt like a real part of it. And there were chairs on the stage for people to sit down, which was useful for me um, and other people. It was it was really wonderful. And I think um, that that's a really great example of what, what can be done. I want to wrap up now and talk about what's next. And we've covered a lot of the stuff already um, in that it's really important to budget for access and to promote access and to consult on access. So what do you think is next? What would you like to see these people in the room do? <laughs> I, I just want to talk a little bit about... It's, it might, hopefully it's not too glass half empty, which I always am. Um, but um, <clears throat> what a shame that there isn't more funding, um, I, is the answer to go to philanthropic, to go to philanthropists to, to maybe hit up some ethical corporate companies? Um, maybe, uh, because when I think about the costs of what we created, it's not sustainable um, and we certainly wouldn't continue to get funding from the Australia Council over and over. We aren't artists with disabilities. Um, so um, I think the funding, even though we, you know, work closely with Asphyxia and she's embedded into the show, um, you know, the work, uh, the, the money, um, there's so little. Um, in the Australia Council now. Um, I think arts South Australia, in South Australia, there's more money for art um, coming from the local government there um, and Credit Victoria. I mean, think about how many people just put in an application, you know, it's, it's really quite overwhelming and very difficult to get a grant. So I, I, I think um, sometimes you can have, like you said, these great ideals and then you start you start looking at the budgets and we had with Selini we probably had about 15 budget meetings where we have to keep going back in reducing fees reducing this reducing mm. expectations and that was fine because we knew that what we were going to create in the end was you know something we'd be really proud of mm -hmm. um, but I think the money and then once you've created it and it's there to go um you have to you know, then market it and you have to have while well, you're creating the next work and generating income as a freelance artist work out how to sell it to producers and then the costs of the show like you said i, I i'm worried that our shows that's it you know mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that might be it. And that's yeah. inevitably what happened with Take Up Thy Bed and Walk, that we, we just ran out of energy, energy as well as money yeah. because yeah. it took four years to get it off the ground. Yeah. And then, and that was in South Australia. So you're actually right. There was more money to support over in South Australia. Yeah. Uh, and then by the time we burnt out, we weren't able to tour it nationally. Yes. I guess what I'm saying in some ways is I, I need answers too, you know. I, I, I want... I, I want to know how to make this. Okay, I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna be more positive. Then. <laughs> okay. okay, this is what I know. I always so, do this. So sorry. So sometimes I know time is money, but when there's a lack of money, just give yourself more time, and then you can you know like I learnt jobs that needed to happen, so as we didn't have to pay someone else to do it. So just mm. time to and do that. I also said to you know if you fringe artist you know if you're thinking about the fringe festival maybe don't apply this year maybe get your budget ready yeah. for next year get your plan it's going to be the and same maybe, kind of application um, process there's no harm in doing creative developments to start with too because that's where you learn a lot of stuff so don't necessarily push for doing a show yeah. straight away straight maybe away. Yeah. 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 even for us like we don't have to perform this big show all the time it's like uh having a, you know a portfolio of works that, you, that you're doing and that some of them and i guess also like our particular access required a certain amount of technology but there's a whole different way lots of lots and lots of ways that you can provide accessibility so i guess just because like we're saying it costs money or whatever like if you can do that first step then that's yeah. the first that's the and first step so you, that's going to be better than no step you don't have to provide all forms of access in the yeah. in the guide that that we've got from melbourne fringe that there's a lot of ways to provide access yeah. you don't have to do everything and often yeah. some some forms of access don't work with other forms of access. Yes. Like if you're making a relaxed performance and dimming yeah. the lights, then perhaps you can't see the odds line interpreters. Exactly. So. Our, our uh, zine we actually talked about, it wasn't of what you would normally experience a full relaxed performance to be because that would have provided, would have taken away the deaf access, mm. just as you're saying. So we yeah. just had to be really, really clear about what the access was. Yeah. And, and 
Oh, and perhaps either. get um, good partnerships with people from the disability sector. I mean, we're quite happy to, you know, ask, ask us questions, you know, what would work for you? How yeah. can we make the show better for yeah. all types of people? Mm. When I did Access to Fashion last year, um, I did I, I did GoFundMe, which was great. We raised a lot of money. And then just through word of mouth, I had two companies approach me going, can we give you money? I'm like, yes, please. And they were companies that were great. One of them was a disability-specific um, employment company and the other one was um, around accessibility. And so that funded the hairdresser's fees. Uh, the one of them, the jobs one, they said they wanted to pay someone's wage. I said, okay, you can pay for the hairdressers on the day. And the other one paid for the Auslan interpreting and the live streaming. So that was great that people just wanted to give us money. And again, there were companies, not government, because the government grants take ages. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I also think from a, half, a glass half empty, and I'm not unappreciative of those here today, but look at all the empty chairs. Um, and that that for me really disappoints me. I find that uh, people think that, oh, access or disability isn't for them, but it's for everybody. Uh, there's a likelihood that 90% of the population will become disabled in their mm -hmm. lives. Um, and so, you know, you, you have 20% of the population is already disabled or, or deaf, and you need to think about that and think about who your market is. And as I was saying before, when I was doing my book tour, one of my um, publisher um, publicists in uh, another state said they've never, never seen anyone any anyone have so many wheelchair users at their event and they that was clear that I helped that happen you know I helped make that happen um, because I reached out to the community we also had um, in Brisbane we had six people with the same skin condition as mine in the room which was amazing because you know there's like a one in a million skin condition so that was incredible to have all those people and it was because I reached out it was because I made it accessible for people you've got to do that I was thinking what Asphyxia said to us um, about having captions as well. <clears throat> it was because she said quite a lot um, of the community um, don't know Auslan because they go deaf um, by an accident or over time. A lot of musicians go deaf, um, you know. So, yeah, um, having that caption, having those two access points meant that we could um, provide – yeah, because people don't – people think that uh, – think about disability often as from birth, um, that it's see it as acquired, yeah. I think also it would be great if you could tell your colleagues about this event. It's been recorded. Show them. Force it down their throats. I mean, not physically, but, you know. Um, tell, them how, tell them how important it is because it is disappointing to see more than half the chairs empty today. And, you know, as an artist, I always go when I'm in a show or uh, professionally, I go, are there going to be shows that are accessible? I always make it a point to ask all yeah. the time. And if there isn't, why is it there? There should be one. And you've got to kind of force the point home sometimes. Yeah, I've <laughs> even asked people to find a different venue for me because it's not accessible. And they've said, oh, there's a toilet 300 metres down the road. And I said, do you want to go to the toilet 300 metres down the road? Mm. And the other thing actually is to think about where the accessible seats are. Like sometimes with the wheelchairs are places, like that is totally blocked sight lines yeah. and so you know what's technically ticking a box of being accessible and what actually is yeah, I don't know a very if you good point. it's often the case that accessibility is not very or the you know the disabled toilets are used for storage which is a pretty common story yeah things mm. like that yeah mm. and also think about your performers like who you might work with and making the space accessible inclusive and safe as well like inclusivity and accessibility isn't just about physical access mm. it's about the language you use and the amount that you pay people and um, or whether you do it all and also um, just inviting us to work with you I, I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Crusader Hillison and Roland because mm -hmm. hairs and hyenas uh, um, you know, they worked really hard to make sure that there was uh, accessibility there and they're always open and willing to learn and they never get offended. I notice when, you know, somebody gives them feedback that's difficult or challenging, they're like, yep, we'll take it on, we'll, we'll do better. You know, I, yeah. they're great. I love them. So great. Interestingly, actually, our, our kind of connection to the disability community is more through the queer community yeah. than through the general arts community. So it's just an interesting kind of overlap that happens mm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say before we close up? I, I want to. I want to again. It sounds like I want to thank the Art Centre again for for um, 
the grant within the Arts Centre that allowed us to do this because without that it wouldn't have happened and the great support that we had from the producers and the access team and, and for putting this on and allowing us to um, be on the stage as allies. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to thank you for all the preparation that you did. <laughs> it was really amazing. And Emma, yep. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and thank you to the Arts Centre again and thank you to you for coming. And thanks to Fringe for, yeah. you know, for partnering. I'm yeah. from Fringe. But it was really great to be able to, um, you know, work on this as part of my day job. Um, just a reminder as well, um, there are some of the producer guide to access. And this is, like, not just for Fringe artists. It's for every, I think, every organisation in the arts. Um, I think it's really useful. I know I made it, but I think it's really useful. <laughs> <laughs> are you reviewing and your own work? I'm reviewing Callie? my own work. What are you it's saying? Very you know, you've good. got to get reviews in <laughs> however way you can. Um, and, you know, tell your, tell your friends, tell your colleagues. You can um, get it online and send it around. And, yeah, we'd be really grateful if you could do that. And I hope to see you at some fringe shows this year. We, um, our program launches in April, uh, August, not April. Uh, and the festival is on from the 12th to 29th of September. Have you got any shows coming up, Emma? I currently don't have any shows coming up, but mm. I am a bookkeeper and I run my own company <laughs> called Small Fortunes Bookkeeping if anyone needs any bookkeeping time. Um, and your book? I've got a book out. It's called <laughs> Say Hello. But I, I am talking at the Emerging Writers Festival this week and I have to talk about the arts and self-care which and then I have to rush to this other thing which is ridiculous because it's not reflective of self-care at all. That's not self-care so at all. I'm talking at um, Progress in after that and I have a book out and it's called Say Hello. And also growing up African in Australia. And what about you, Sarah? What are you yeah, doing? what are you doing? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> what are we doing? I'm going to the Venice Biennale with shit, oh the play. God. So I'm excited. Um, Beck's working with the Fruit Fly Circus. So we've wow. all got bits and pieces happening in our Great. lives. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, thanks to our Auslan interpreters, Dave. Thank you. And Linda.